All right, I am back with another video, and welcome back to Apocalypse Week, the week where we're going to be building all four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, so that by the end of the week you'll have a full party build featuring all of them. And today, we're going to be doing the Red Rider himself, War. War is the second of the four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and represents, well, War. <laughs> And unlike Conquest slash Pestilence, who we did yesterday, the Horsemen of War is more about waging war between nations and other peoples, rather than like civil war and internal strife. Now, there were some people who, who were commenting last time saying that, I, that war and Conquest are actually swapped. I don't know, s multiple sources say different things, I'm just going with the sources that I was given and that people seem to think was the most reliable on the livestream, so that's what I'm going for here. If there are some historical inaccuracies, I do apologise, but I am both trying to do like a historically accurate version as well as a version that makes sense with kind of like the pop culture references that come with it. For example, I know Death isn't, doesn't actually have a scythe in historical accuracy, but of course he's so recognisable with a scythe, it, would make, it wouldn't make sense not to include it, so when we get there, we'll get there. That's just an example. But back on War, basically he's basically known for holding his great sword, whereas, um, you know, the other riders each kind of have their object that kind of sets them apart. For example, Conquest had the bow. We today are going to be using a great sword as you can see from our little dragonborn here well i say little he's a bit pretty big lad and the sword is meant to suggest that blood will be spilled so basically uh like it is just raising that sword high is a signal that war shall begin and that's what i'm thinking right that's kind of the essence that i wanted to capture with this build is that when this guy enters the battlefield he raises his sword high and signals the start of war. So, I wanted this character to be the frontline fighter of the party. I wanted him to be the one who gets in there, down and dirty, deals massive damage, and basically takes the aggro off of most enemies. So, and also kind of fitting into that theme of war and conflict, basically just starting conflict wherever he walks. And, well, we might as well just get straight into the build here, since the combat footage is rather short. Tell me, when you think of a character who raises their sword high in battle, what else is there other than... Paladin. Paladin is going to give us a ton of stuff that we want. It's a charisma based character, meaning this, that this could also be the face of the party if you so choose. We gain a bunch of cool stuff that is going to keep us going during battle, like for example Lay on Hands to give us a bit of healing, which will synergize with some features we'll get later. Divine Sense for attack rolls against, you know, abhorrent things that go against the very nature of life and death and such like that. And also our channel hope stuff. Now, as for our subclass, you could go with any of these. Over Devotion might make sense because of their devotion, because uh, of like the Four Horsemen's devotion to, I guess, you know, the Bible figures and such like that. Uh, Oath of Vengeance is more combat orientated, but we decided that there was a couple of abilities from Oathbreaker that we really, really wanted to get that would make sense. Because I want th wanted this build to not only just be about, you know, spreading blood, spreading war and bloodshed and all this, but also about spreading fear, because war is a scary, bloody thing. So we're going to be going with Oathbreaker. So once I've gone through the initial kind of abilities and such like that, I'll go commit a crime and then we'll come right back. So first up for our ability scores, it's a pretty standard paladin spread. Strength is at 16 because it's going to be our main attacking stat. Dexterity is at 12 so we don't have abysmal initi initiative orders, but of course you can change that around as you like. Constitution is at 14, would have liked that to be a bit higher, but honestly we needed our other stats more, and Charisma is at 16. With some of the equipment that I'll be showing off later, you might be able to switch uh, Constitution and Charisma, it's entirely up to you, so feel free to kind of swap those stats around if you feel it is necessary. And this is also a heavy armor build, so if you don't care about initiative order, feel free to just drop Dexterity down to 8 and put Wisdom to 12 instead, as we will be using a little bit of Wisdom with this build, but not a, ma not a massive amount. Next up, our skill proficiencies. I went with the Soldier background for obvious reasons, giving us athletics and intimidation and i've chosen persuasion and insight as our other skills although i could absolutely see actually swapping insight for religion now that i think about it so probably do that instead anyways be right back after i get oathbreaker and here we are with level one of Oathbreaker. Oathbreaker at the early level is going to give us spiteful suffering, allowing us to use our channel Oath Charge to mark a target for three turns. That target is going to take an extra bit in the necrotic damage, and attack rolls against them have advantage, which is going to work swimmingly for us. Next up, at Paladin level 2, we're going to get all the stuff that we really, really want from Paladin. First up, we're going to be getting our Divine Smite, of course, our big damage dealing option, as well as what we do to raise our sword to the sky, as that is literally the animation to signal off the start of war. Absolutely brilliant skill. Again, I had to make this a Paladin once I realized that connection, as soon as I read that bit of the mythology, shall we say. So that's why this build is going to be a Paladin. And I guess the Four Horsemen are technically, again, since they're technically agents of the Apocalypse and agents of, you know, 
the, again, Bible figures, perhaps there is a bit of holiness in there. Honestly, I kind of wish Oathbreaker swapped the Radiant Damage from the Crotic, because that would have been really cool, but whatever. Doesn't really matter. We want Divine Smite because it is just too perfect for this build most most of the time. Also, we do get a fighting style, and of course, we're going to go with Great Weapon Fighting because we are wielding a Great Sword. Next up, we get to choose our spells, and let me start, start off with one of the spells that I really, really wanted to get for this build, Compelled Duel. Force an enemy to attack only you, giving it disadvantage against other targets. Again, literally signaling the start of war. Use this as a bonus action to force an enemy into combat with you, declaring war on them, and then smite them down with your Divine Smite, raising your sword to signal the start of combat. It is so, so cool. It's a fun thematic combination that works perfectly for war, especially this early on in the game. In a similar vein, we will grab Command as another way to kind of force enemies to kind of do what we want them to do, moving closer to us, probably mainly or maybe we can even make them like drop their weapon as if they've dropped their weapon in sheer fear and it's like a dis and then like it's like dishonorable and all that i don't know have some fun with this one and then we're just going to pick up the rest of these smite spells just to give ourselves a few more extra damage options i quite like wrathful smite here especially because again it can inflict fear so i feel like again that kind of fits the vibe that we're going for and since we are a red dragonborn because we are the red rider searing smite kind of also makes sense there thunderous smite is just thunderous smite it can knock enemies prone which is quite nice Next up, Paladin level 3, we're going to get access to a few things. Number one, our Channel Oath stuff that isn't just uh, Spiteful Suffering. Uh, there is the Control Undead one, and there was a bit of discourse in the last video where I said, I don't really want to be focusing on Controlling Undead with these builds. Some people said, well, there's still no reason not to use them, and that's perfectly valid. So Control Undead is still there, but I am personally going to be suggesting the other option, Dreadful Aspect, to frighten nearby enemies. We have a lot of ways of inflicting fear, because again, war is bloody terrifying. Anyways, we also get Hellish Rebuke, a fire-based counter-attack. Someone attacks us and we get to retaliate with fire. Makes sense, where a red dragonborn feels perfectly on theme, as well as inflict wounds to give us a big necrotic damage. Melee range spell. We also can gain access to another spell at this point, and I'm going to grab Heroism. We're not exactly heroic, but being able to make ourselves immune to being frightened while we ourselves spread fear and give us five temporary hit points each turn. Not a bad option for your concentration, although pretty much all of these use concentration except for command, so you're definitely going to be having to pick and choose what you want to use here. Next up at Paladin level 4, we are going to gain access to another Lay on Hands charge, as well as our first feat of the build. At this point, I would probably just recommend an Ability Score improvement to bump up that strength, just to make, to make it so that we have pretty decent uh, stats all around here. And since this is our main attacking stat, we are going to want this up first. Especially now, by this point, you probably have a, the piece of equipment that I'm going to be suggesting. You all already know what it is. That's going to bump up our Spell Save DC. So... I would say focus on strength for now, and if you want to, pick up the Potion of Everlasting Vigor in Act 2 to bump this up to a 20. At Paladin level 5, we're going to be getting extra attack as well as level 2 spells, including the two domain or oath spells, I should say, that we really wanted from this build, at least one of them. Crown of Madness, allowing us to instill madness in a humanoid enemy, making them attack any creature that is close to them. So we raise our sword to signal the start of war, and then everyone starts killing each other. Mass bloodshed, mass slaughter. Crown of Madness felt like such an appropriate spell for this build, but I absolutely wanted to get it somehow. And the fact that Oathbreaker Paladin gets it, absolutely perfect. And the people in the community agreed with me because this, it's too cool, man. It is too cool. In fact, I think somebody in the community suggested it. I apologize if that was you because that stream was a little while ago now. We do also get Darkness, but I've not necessarily focused on it on this build with this build. But if you wanted to pick up the Eversight Ring to basically do Darkness Devil Sight with this build, you absolutely could, which would be a very, very powerful strategy. So feel free to play around a little bit with the equipment on this one to maybe enable this strategy as well. And in addition to our other level two spells, we do get to pick up a couple. The game has already picked Magic Weapon for us, and I actually think that's a pretty thematic option as well as branding smite making it so where enemies cannot become invisible meaning that nobody's going to get the jump on you nobody's allowed to slink around the battlefield they must face you one on one in honorable combat Next up, at Paladin level 6, we're going to gain access to our Armor of Protection. Us and any nearby allies gain a, gain a bonus to saving throws equal to our Charisma modifier. Not going to be the highest thing in the world since like, we don't really level up Charisma with this build, unfortunately. We mainly just want it at 16 just to fuel the, these abilities kind of at their basic function. But any bonus to saving throws is absolutely welcome, and since it affects the other horsemen, it felt like a good team build. 
kind of thing, I suppose. We do also gain access to another level 2 spell. Uh, it's entirely up to you, or a level 1, I guess. It's entirely up to you what you want to pick here. I suppose there's nothing wrong with a little bit of healing just to keep ourselves going, because again, war is unending, so we just keep going and going and going, healing as we go. Entirely up to you if you want to swap this out for something else. We'll be able to get up some, get some of this other, more useful stuff a bit later in the build. Next up, at Paladin level 7, we're going to gain access to Aura of Hate, meaning that us and any nearby fiends and undead, so mainly just us, are going to gain an additional extra bit of damage, equal to our Charisma modifier, so in our case here, 3, uh, to our damage dealt with melee weapons. It's just more damage, as well as getting us into level 2 spell slots as well, which we kind of already had, but we want to, this with the way the spell slots work out in this build, we'll have a pretty decent amount by the end. You do get another level 2 spell at this point. I don't know, pick whatever you like. Protection from poison just gives you an extra resistance if you want it. Moving away from Paladin now, as much as I would like this extra feat, we don't really need it on this build the setup that I have, and I do want to get five levels of something else. And that is going to be Cleric with the War Domain. Come on, you really didn't think I was going to do this. Now, of course you could take this one level, a one level dip into War Cleric at any point during this build if you want those bonus action attacks. Absolutely would make sense, feel free to do that, maybe perhaps at level 6 and then maybe come back to Paladin afterwards, but we'll grab War Domain here, so I'm just showing the leveling in order, but you can play around with it a little bit, just make sure you're not delaying your extra attack too much. War Domain is going to be great, it's going to give us access to a few things, it, the spell selection does overlap with Paladin a little bit, but the main thing that we're going to be getting here is War Priest, allowing us to uh, every so often per long rest, depending on how many charges you have, at this level we have three, you can make an extra attack as a bonus action. Really, really cool uh, ability for us. Unfortunately, it is limit to, limited to a certain amount of charges per long rest, which is why I kind of prioritize getting extra attack over this. But now we'll have an option to do, go absolutely Nova for a few turns uh, with this build, with the extra attacks made, being made as a bonus action. We also do gain access to a few cantrips. Now, we did dump Wisdom with this build, but of course you could have swapped Dexterity and Wisdom if you wanted to get a little bit more out of this. However, again, we'll be able to patch it up regardless. So I'm just going to pick up our utility cantrips, that being Resistance, Guidance, and Thaumaturgy. We're also going to get to choose our deity. Now, obviously, we can't really pick a deity that makes sense for this, since we technically are an agent of a different deity than what is selectable here. So feel free to pick something that's just combat-based. Grumpsh could be easy, uh, like an easy pick. He's a god of war, conquest, and victory at all costs. Could make sense. Uh, Tempus is the lord of battles, overseeing war and his soldiers. He is the embodiment of honorable combat and condemns needless bloodlust. Everything until the needless bloodlust bit made sense for that because we've kind of gone for a little bit of like just it's time for the slaughter but again if the four horsemen are here does it is the bloodlust really meaningless they're here to f do, do the apocalypse which means it's the end times this is meant to happen so honestly perhaps tempest does make sense choose whatever you think is appropriate here perhaps i've missed something we do also get to prepare a spell at this point and i would say it's completely up to you what you want to choose here obviously best utility spell in the game sanctuary does exist but I don't necessarily see War buffing himself with this. I would absolutely see him absolutely see him buffing one of the other horsemen with this. Perhaps Famine. And you'll see why when we get to the Famine build. So I'm going to put it on this build, but if you don't think it's thematically appropriate, take something like Healing Word instead. Next up, at Cleric level 2, we're going to gain access to Channel Divinity Charges and our Channel Divinity ability, Guided Strike, allowing us to gain a plus 10 bonus on an attack roll. This is going to be very handy later. At Cleric level 3, we're going to get access to level 2 spells, and I'm going to be choosing for our second spell, Aid. Aid is going to allow us to increase us and our allies' hit points by 5, equal to the level of the spell slot. We have a maximum of level 4 spell slots by the time we're finished with this build, and we're mainly going to be want to, wanting to spend those on our smites, so the highest I could see you casting this would be level 3, but hey, 10 extra hit points is 10 extra hit points. There's other things we could do, like hold person if you wanted to always guarantee critical hits, but again, I don't really see that as honorable combat, I guess. Um, but if you wanted to go with that, you absolutely could. Just, rem be a re just reminded that our spell safety C is quite low until we start building up our spell safety C with our equipment. Uh, you could also go for warding bond if you want to protect the other horsemen that way. Entirely up to you. Choose what you like. Next up at Cleric Level 4, we are going to be getting our next feat. A bit late into the build, obviously. We'll quickly pick a cantrip first. I won't have produced flame because it looks badass just to leave it on your arm. And we also do get to prepare another spell at this level. I'll go with Warding Bond. And finally, we do get, an, to get, get to pick a feat here. And I would say... 
Let's grab Great Weapon Master. I mean, come on. Great Weapon Master is going to allow us to, whenever we land a critical hint or kill a target with a melee weapon attack, we can make another we melee weapon attack as a bonus action that turn. So we don't have to use our War Priest charges all the time to get those big attacking rounds, as well as we deal an additional flat 10 damage on all of our melee attacks at the cost of a negative 5 attack roll penalty. We have many ways of boosting our chance to hit thanks to War God's Guided Strike. We also have... Um, uh, spiteful Suffering to give us advantage on our attack rolls. If you wanted to do the Darkness Devil Sight strategy with the Eversight Ring, you absolutely could. There's so many different ways to offset this penalty with this build that it really isn't a problem. So this is basically free damage. And finally, at War Cleric level 5, we're going to get access to a few things. Now, if you really don't care for the level 3 level three spells here, you could go to Paladin 8 for another feat, and honestly, that would not be a miss. But we did kind of decide that we liked the idea of going War Cleric 5. Because War Cleric 5 would allow us to use Destroy Undead, and again, I kind of have this thing where this party hates Undead, uh, so Destroy Undead kind of made sense. But we are also going to get our hands on Crusader's Mantle and Spirit Guardians. Crusader's Mantle is going to allow all of our allies to do a bit of extra Radiant damage with their attacks. As Spirit Guardians, since we are a melee build, we can set this to Necrotic or Radiant, whatever you prefer. I kind of prefer Necrotic, and just run in there hitting with our sword and doing extra damage through Spirit Guardians, which also slows enemies down, meaning they have a harder time getting away. Obviously, again, low spell safety C, but if you've built up enough charges from the Helmet of Arcane Acuity, I'm just going to say it, then that won't be an issue either. So Spirit Guardians, I think, is quite valuable on this build, and it is what we ultimately decided to go with, but if you think that's 8th eighth, eighth level of Paladin is more valuable to you, then I would say take that and pick up the extra feat, bump up your Charisma or your Strength if you've not taken the Potion of Everlasting Vigor. Next up, uh, for spells, we do gain a level 3 spell at this point, and it's entirely up to you what you want to pick here. Uh, you could go for a healing option of Mass Healing Word if you really wanted to kind of keep keep yourself and your party alive. Uh, there is Glyph of Warding, which can let you set elemental traps, but again, not really honourable combat in my opinion. Honestly, this is a pick your favourite situation, do whatever you like to do. I would say if you want another option to kind of gain advantage on targets, Blindness could work, so we'll go with that. And that is the build. Overall, what you're getting out of this is an absolute monster when it comes to damage dealing. This character is going to be absolutely shredding people left, right, and center, instilling madness to make them attack each other, attacking them with massive damage with things like Spirit Guardians as well, if you wanted to go down that route. Although I guess I kind of prefer Crown of Madness, but again, you have options available to you, especially if you maybe you're in a one-on-one -on -one fight. You have a ton of ways to buff your damage and your defenses, thanks to Aura of Protection and Aura of Hate which looks awesome. And of course, we just have a bunch of utility things lay on hands to keep us healthy, as well as our own healing spells aid to give us more health. Uh, we have all the utility options like Sanctuary if we absolutely desperately need it. We just have a ton of cool stuff here. Look, I can even do Produce Flame to get the blue. I don't know why that's the voice line. I've messed that up at some point. But yeah, look, the blue flame on the arm looks really, really cool in my opinion. So yeah, you have so much going for you here. But again, like with all of my builds, the equipment is where it really starts to come into its own. So let's have a look at that. As for the equipment, uh, let's go over my main weapon of choice here, which is the Sword of Chaos. We basically, the community's decided, hey... The Sword of Chaos is basically required on this build, and I can see why. An extra d4 of necrotic damage, and also regaining 1d6 hit points on every hit, as well as it being a plus 2 weapon. This is going to allow us to keep ourselves healthy and keep the battle going. Felt incredibly thematic for this build, and is again going to synergize with some equipment that we'll be getting in a minute. Next up, oh, but I will say, Act 3 option, obviously. So let's have a look at the early game option, which is Svartalby's Wound Seeker. This wielder gains 1d4, uh, 1d4 bonus to attack rolls with this weapon when attacking creatures that have already taken damage. So this is actually going to be great if you maybe decided to take Great Weapon Master as your first feat rather than your second, which I would actually probably recommend now that I think about it, because if you get the Potion of Everlasting Vigor, you'll still have 18 strength anyway. So maybe take Great Weapon Master first instead of the Ability Score Improvement and pick up the Potion of Everlasting Vigor instead, if you decide to go down that route. In which case, Svartalby's Wound Seeker will help off set the penalty even more and it's just a very decent early game great sword that you can pick up so that is my personal recommendation 
Next up, the Helmet of Arcane Acuity. Again, I've already talked about it. Whenever we deal damage with a weapon attack, we gain Arcane Acuity and for, e for two turns. And for every turn we have Arcane Acuity, we gain a plus one bonus to spell attack rolls and difficulty class. So just for one weapon attack, we gain a plus two bonus to our spell difficulty class, which is great for things like Crown of Madness, Spirit Guardians, all that sort of thing. This can stack up to 10 times, meaning you can get a plus 10 bonus to your uh, spell safety C, which is huge. Even with our wisdom-based cleric stuff, even though we dump the stat, we will still be able to do absolutely massive amounts of damage with those spells so this is absolutely perfect especially with the amount of times we're going to be able to attack in a turn between great weapon master and war war priest charges which i believe we have four of at this point let me just double check yes so you can do four bonus attacks per long rest with that feature which is huge so a helmet of arcane acuity is absolutely perfect for this build and is found pretty early in the game now those of you who remember the live streams would have remembered that actually we picked the brow beaten circlet as our option which gives you a plus one bonus to spell safety c while threatened so if you're surrounded by enemies honestly as much as i love this feature and maybe if you decided to use the helmet on a different build from these from this party you could still use this one but overall we kind of i had to kind of go with the helmet of arcane acuity to patch up our lower spell casting stats so apologies that i kind of swapped that one but it's still an option if you want to Next up, our cloak, the Vivacious Cloak. You gain ten, uh, sorry, you gain eight temporary hit points after casting a spell while in melee. We're going to be doing that quite a lot with this build, so three temporary hit points to keep make us even tankier just makes sense. Now, our armor, the plate armor plus two, not something I've ever shown off on this channel before. And this is done pretty much purely for fashion. It's still a really good armor set coming with a 28 base 20 armor class, which is perfect for us. And we take two less bludgeoning, uh, two less physical damage, so it's pretty good. But it also has quite a unique model, giving us these massive pauldrons and, you know, this kind of red kind of scarf here. Unfortunately, I've got, so I had to kind of mix and match a few colors here. We've got sinful red on bone white, red dye, and the white and scarlet dye to kind of get the look that you see here. Unfortunately, trying to color heavy armor in red doesn't really work. The most I can kind of get is these like red accents and obviously the red head. So you can still tell this is the red rider, but unfortunately most of this is kind of like faded gold metal, but I think that still kind of works looks wise. Uh, anyways, but like I said, this armor was really, really unique. It comes with the massive pauldrons. We thought the design was just absolutely amazing. Uh, I did have a look at the black guards plate, which would take away a level of your armor class, but also reduce all incoming damage by one, not just the physical damage. So if you kind of wanted to swap that out for this one, you absolutely could, but I kind of didn't really like the look of it that much on this build. So I think the actual plate armor itself still looks better. And I actually quite like the way it looks on this build, but of course this is an Act 3 piece of gear, or technically Act 2 if you reach a high enough level, because this one comes from vendors. So if you want an early game option that makes sense, the plate armor is the way to go. The plate armor will give you a flat 18 armor class, as well as resistance to necrotic damage, which does make sense. I did forget to color it. Let's color it in red really quickly. Yeah, that looks all right. But like I said, I would say the plate armor to go with first, and then the plate armor plus two when you're there. I believe this is actually called the protective plate in game. I think that might be an early access name because mods are weird. Next up, our gloves, the reviving hands. Whenever we heal a creature, and that can be including self-healing that we get from the Sword of Chaos, or, or any of our spells, of course, we basically, whenever we heal the creature, it gains the effects of Blade Ward, meaning that we will have resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, making us even more tanky. And whenever you revive a creature, it gains the effect of Death Ward. So, and we also gain a usage of Revivify. So this maybe is kind of like Death himself helping us out here, allowing us to stave off our own death. And again, more of that when we get into his build. Uh, so we'll probably not be using the Revivify aspect of this too much, because obviously we can't really heal ourselves. But Death Blade Ward is a really, really nice thing. Just ha basically constantly having resistance to physical damage with this build, as well as having it reduced by the plate armor, means that physical attacks just aren't going to do anything to us. We're like a barbarian paladin without actually being a barbarian but of course this is an early uh, this is a late game option if you want the early game variant of this you can pick up the gloves of heroism uh or, well no there is an early game uh variant of this called the hell riders pride which you could also use but i wanted to show off the gloves of heroism here whenever you use your channel oath spells you gain heroism so we use a channel oath feature such as spiteful suffering we gain heroism which means we, we won't have to cast that spell and it also means it won't use our concentration so I think that's pretty good. I would have personally used this one. Anyways, 
Moving on, Boots of Persistence. We gain Freedom of Movement and Longstrider. Yeah, this is just kind of a filler slot, just a generic good option. Freedom of Movement is going to be great for us, making it so that we're not going to be affected by a bunch of annoying effects, as well as Longstrider giving us more movement speed so we can close in on our enemies a lot easier. Uh, but an early game option for this, I would just suggest the Vital Conduit Boots, which means that whenever we cast a spell that requires concentration, we gain eight temporary hit points. This is just another way of getting hit points since we do have a lot of concentration spells, again, making us even more tanky. Next up, the Amulet of the Devout. We're going to gain a plus two bonus to our spell save DC, which is going to help patch up both of our lowest, kind of lowest spell casting ability scores, as well as we gain an additional use of Channel Divinity, which is another use of War God's, War God's Strike, meaning that we're going to gain that plus 10 bonus twice now. We also gain access to the Killer's Sweetheart. Again, every Paladin I have will run this, and this build is no exception. Whenever this, whenever you kill a creature, you gain a reaction that you can spend to guarantee that an attack becomes a critical hit once per long rest. A guaranteed critical hit on a Paladin is absolutely absurd, so I would absolutely take that. And finally, we have the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel. After hitting a creature with a weapon attack, you can cast Illusion or Enchantment spells as a bonus action. Crown of Madness is an enchantment spell, meaning that you can attack someone and then inflict someone else with Crown of Madness. Same as Compelled Duel, you can attack someone and then force that person to either fight only you or choose another character to come and join the fray. Basically, you're going to have a bit more battlefield control using your bonus action thanks to this ring. There may be a couple of other things you can do with this too, but I've not gone into that in too much detail. These were the main two spells that I was thinking of when I picked this one up. Uh, I believe... No, that's, that's necromancy. Shame, but, you know, experiment with it. See if there's anything you can find that perhaps I missed. Uh, but of course, if you're not too into that idea, replace this with either the Eversight Ring for Darkness Devil Sight, or the Risky Ring for just constant advantage without any gaff to fuel Great Weapon Master even more. And yeah, that is the build. Overall, I mean, it's a Paladin Cleric. We get level 4 spell slots, which is the highest smite can scale. Like... We have all the powerful stuff that we absolutely love from a build like this. It's just, it's just good. This is just an absolutely extremely powerful build. I mean, the combat footage here ends very, very quickly. But the fact that we get this extra flavor of battlefield control and spreading fear and all this, and also actually literally being a war paladin with the war cleric levels, it just feels so great. And the way the equipment is set up just to make us tanky and, you know, just hard to kill, I, I love it. I really, really love the theme of this build. I think the, the actual, like, lore and mythology of the Horseman of War, the Red Rider, is captured perfectly here, with raising your sword high, spreading bloodlust, and f making people fight each other in open warfare. It's just so... I love it. I think it's one of the better builds I've made as far as all of this is concerned. Uh, again, feel free to change some of the equipment around here. Perhaps if you want to shore up your other ability scores, maybe swap the Amulet of the Devout for maybe the Amulet of Greater Health. Because if you go for the Amulet of Greater Health, you could dump Constitution, still have an absolutely massive HP pool, and then put some points into Wisdom. Entirely up to you if you want to go down that route. Again, I do recommend the Potion Everlasting Figure, but it's not necessary to make this build work, so feel free to just play around with that as you see fit. But yeah, I absolutely love this build. I this uh, We'll see how the other two builds go, but this might be my favourite of the four horsemen so far. Anyways, that is going to do it for me today because it is hot in my room and I can't have my fan on while I'm recording because you guys would all hear the air and it would mess up the audio. So I am going to go. Thank you all so much for watching and I will see you all next time.